Thanks everyone for joining. Folks are still hopping on, so we'll get started here in just a few minutes. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the January edition of Rafay's Kubernetes Office Hours. I'm Kyle Hunter, Director of Product Marketing here at Rafay, and joining me today is Rafay's VP of Product and Solutions, Mohan Atreya, and special guest Andrew Park, uh, Amazon Partner Solution Architect. He and Mohan are going to educate us all on shared services and cover a few examples where customers have transformed their business by moving to a shared services model. Let's start by reviewing a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute, but if you have a question, please type it in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll wrap up at the, <clears throat> with those at the end, and I'll likely select a few for uh, Andrew and Mohan along the way. This session will be recorded, so we'll be sending it out to uh, all of you, as well as the folks who, who weren't able to make it today. And uh, we're also raffling off uh, $50 Amazon gift cards to those that are attending. So good luck and uh, we'll notify you guys uh, at the end of the week. For those that you don't know who Rafay is, uh, I'll give a brief intro. We provide an enterprise grade Kubernetes operations platform, making it easy to build, deploy and scale modern apps and infrastructure. On the right, you'll see a small sample of our customers. We'll cover today how their platform engineers have implemented a shared services platform. So with that very brief introduction, I'll turn it over to you, Mo, and uh, let you introduce yourself. Well, thank you, Kyle. Um, so uh, as Kyle mentioned, I lead products and solutions at Rafe. And uh, if you want to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out to me via email or, or via Twitter, uh, here are my uh, contact details. And uh, Andrew, you want to introduce yourself as well? Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Andrew Park. I'm a partner solutions architect here at AWS, focused on supporting our container ecosystem and also partners, much like Rafay. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, I'll just spend 30 seconds kind of laying out the agenda for today, and then I'll kind of hand over to Andrew. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll first start with uh, what exactly is a shared services platform for Kubernetes? and uh, why do you need it? And uh, Andrew and I will cover that in some detail in, in the beginning. And then once we understand uh, what is it and why it's needed, we'll kind of run through a few recent customer examples uh, or case studies where uh, those businesses have been able to transform and accelerate their adoption of, uh, of, of Kubernetes, uh, uh, especially EKS uh, internally. And then we'll kind of wrap it up with, uh, uh, articulating some key requirements that uh, we believe every organization needs to factor in uh, if you are um, on a pathway to uh, implement a shared services platform internally. Uh, what are the key requirements for that? And then we'll take some question and answers through the course of the session and also towards the end. Uh, so uh, Kyle will be monitoring uh, the chat and uh, any other questions that come in and uh, I'll leave in the questions as appropriate. Um, so with that, um, uh, Andrew will start with uh, the shared services platform and uh, uh, why and uh, what is it and why is it needed. So Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Mohan. Yeah, so let's kick this off by talking about why we need the shared services platform framework or model. Um, and so if we take a look at this quote right here, um, you know, in the next few years, organizations will build over 500 million new applications, which is more than the number developed in the past 40 years combined. Um, and so, you know, when I personally think about uh, this quote, uh, what this tells me is that, you know, if 
I'm an organization or if I'm a, you know, an organization looking to modernize or move to the cloud, um, I really need to change the way that I think about developing and deploying applications in the cloud, just because of the sheer number of applications that I need to think about um, that will be going into my portfolio, right? And so what this also means is that we also need to change the way we think about infrastructure. We need to change the way we think about automation um, and really the underlying application deployment strategy so that we can enable both our application and infrastructure teams to be as effective as possible, uh, you know, regardless of the scale or the size of the applications that they'll be managing, right? Um, and so if we go to the next slide, um, what this also tells us is that these are some of the uh, few things that we need to start thinking about so that we can move faster and accelerate our time to market um, by adopting new technologies and practices that allow our team to do the following things. Um, so the first one that I call out here is that, you know, we need a better way to onboard services and applications faster, uh, which basically translates to the question of, you know, how can we get our application teams to move from their local environments to a production ready state uh, quicker, right? Um, second point that I want to call out is, you know, how do we facilitate an environment for our teams to experiment with new ideas and technologies to nurture growth, both from an infrastructure uh, and application perspective? And then the last point that I call out is, you know, how do we then reduce the time uh, for ramp up for new engineers and new teams that are, will be onboarded to our organization, right? And how do we get their productivity up from the ground running? Um, and so, you know, when I typically think of, you know, the why we need the SSP is, or a shared services platform is it's, tip, it typically comes down to these three things that I just called out. Right. Um, and what this ultimately boils down to is, you know, how are we going to increase developer productivity across an organization? Right. You know, how do we know that we're picking the right tools, the right platforms, the right practices to ensure that again, um, you know, we're making sure that our developers are being, are being as productive as possible so that we can get to market quicker. Um, and so for these reasons, um, that's why we need to start thinking about uh, the SSP model. And so if we go to the next slide, um, here at AWS, you know, I've worked with a um, handful of customers that have uh, adopted this approach or in the process of adopting this approach. And so in working with these customers, um, here are some of the benefits that I've seen uh, from the customers that have been able to do this successfully. Um, so like I mentioned before, uh, First and foremost, it's going to increase developer productivity and it's going to speed up the pace of software delivery. Um, what these customers have seen as well is that the infrastructure that they need to build an SSP is being spun up faster that, than faster than they've ever seen before. Um, and what that also leads to is that it enables their application teams to move quicker as well. And so they're seeing their applications being deployed much quicker. They're seeing things going to production much quicker. Um, and more importantly, that they're doing this much more cost and resource efficiently. Um, the second thing that I've seen from customers that have adopted this approach is that the platform teams in particular uh, have full control and visibility, both at the infrastructure and application level, while having the ability to include all the security and operational best practices that you would want uh, while operating in the cloud. Uh, the last thing that I've, I've seen and noticed uh, from customers that adopted the SSP approach is that, you know, instead of having to provide teams their own separate resources or infrastructure, um, teams can now utilize shared resources by leveraging a centralized platform, uh, which obviously leads to a decrease in operational overhead, because instead of having to allocate various resources to different teams, um, you know, using uh, shared infrastructure and shared resources, um, you know, there's less you have to manage overall, right? And so your teams are able to not only work together uh, better and more effectively, um, but they can also deploy new features uh, much quicker as well, right? And so, um, you know, again, working with these customers, these are some of the benefits that I've, I've seen. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, um, you might be asking, you know, you've talked to me about why we need it, you know, some of the things that you've seen with customers that you've worked with, but what is an actual SSP and, you know, why should I care, right? And so let's talk about what that SSP actually is. So a shared services platform is an internal development platform that allows multiple teams to run applications on shared infrastructure that's managed, secured, and governed by a central platform team. And so if we go to the next slide, um, what this ultimately means is that, you know, when we see customers take uh, this approach and when we start thinking about the number of applications that they'll have to onboard to, you know, uh, an SS or a shared services platform, uh, you really need to start thinking about the economies of scale with respect to application development in the cloud. 
Because, um, you know, by taking a cloud native approach, not only are you going to be able to deploy applications much quicker, but you also think, you have to start thinking about how you're going to automate all of this um, in the cloud as well, right? And so, you know, we mentioned at the start of this webinar that, you know, 500 million new applications will be built over the next few years. And so, you know, when you're thinking about how you're going to tackle this with your organization, um, you know, you have to start thinking about, well, what platform could I use to help enable my teams as quickly as possible to ensure that, you know, when I start seeing this level of scale, uh, my teams are prepared for that, right? And so that's kind of where the shared services platform framework comes in, is that, you know, it allows customers to get ahead of this challenge by gaining those, that economy of scale with respect to the number of applications being developed um, by, again, using cloud native technologies and tooling, um, which fits in really well to the shared services platform approach. And so if you go to the next slide, um, here's more of a visual representation of kind of what this means and kind of what this looks like under the hood. And so at the bottom, we have your modern compute layer. Um, and this is really what's going to power your shared services platform, right? And so in this particular case, uh, what I've seen from customers that have adopted the SSP approach is that they're, they'll, they'll be using something like Amazon EKS. Um, the reason for that is, you know, when you use something like Amazon EKS, not only do you get the benefits of a managed Kubernetes service, but you also still get the benefits of leveraging the Kubernetes open source ecosystem. Because, you know, when we think about it, the reason why you use something like Kubernetes is because you want to still be able to leverage all the open source tooling that the community has developed uh, within your Kubernetes infrastructure. And so, you know, again, by leveraging something like EKS, not only do you get the benefits of a managed service, but you still have access to all the tools that you want to use from the open source community. And so uh, if we take a look at the middle here, um, this is kind of where the, the meat of uh, an SSP comes in. Um, so if you take a look at the middle, uh, you see all the components that actually build the SSP itself, right? So when we start thinking about things like policy management, uh, CICD, governance, observability, security, secrets management, uh, storage, uh, these are all the things that you want you, that you need to think about uh, when you think about a shared services platform, because these are the resources that your application teams and your platform teams will need to be effective um, operating on that uh, centralized platform, right? And so with that said, um, when we take a look at the top layer of an SSP, then you have your applications. And so this is really going to be more focused on your application team being able to develop and deploy applications um, into production. Um, and so, you know, when we think about what I was saying earlier about being able to operate on shared infrastructure, um, this all operates on a single platform, right? And so as your platform teams are implementing the tools and practices that your application team needs to be able to move quick or quickly, um, you know, again, this is all running on shared infrastructure. And so, you know, when you take this approach, um, like I mentioned before, uh, you're going to have less administrative overhead of the management of the tools and platforms that you'll need to enable your teams. And two, um, your teams work harmoniously together better because, you know, pre previously, if you've worked in other um, organizations, you know, from an application team, if you need access to a service or if there's a bug or et cetera, you know, you'd have to submit a Jira ticket or some sort of ticket to your infrastructure, your platform team. Uh, that takes time in itself. Um, it just becomes this back and forth process and it just kind of adds more time to market and it's not a very it's not a very effective process. But taking this approach, you're leveraging shared infrastructure, you're leveraging shared tooling. Um, and because you're leveraging a, uh, a centralized platform, um, it's a lot easier to handle these types of issues moving forward, right? And so for these reasons, uh, this is the reason why we like to promote the shared services platform approach is because it not only is solved, not only does it solve a lot of the problems that we see in cloud native tooling and technologies, but it also allows you to move quicker. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, like I mentioned before, uh, we want to make sure that we're enabling our developers to move as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And so again, um, this is kind of what uh, an, a good SSP will look like under the hood. Um, again, you have your modern compute with things like Amazon EKS. In the middle, you have uh, shared tooling and infrastructure um, that is managed centrally by your platform teams. And then you have your application teams that are purely focused on developing and deploying uh, the applications themselves. And so if you go to the next slide, um, this is just a, a, a snapshot of the cloud native uh, landscape of all the different tools that you have access to. Uh, when you are using something like Kubernetes. And so while this can be daunting for some that are early on in their journey uh, with Kubernetes or building an SSP, um, this also provides a lot of opportunity for different configurations and different combination of tooling 
uh, to build an SSP that matches your business outcomes and business goals, right? Um, so even for something like observability, um, just, just looking at the snapshot, you have tons of different resources and tools used for your observ observability needs. Um, this also goes for CI, CD. This also goes for storage, security, um, the list goes on. And so again, like I mentioned uh, at the start of this webinar, um, the, the reason why you use Kubernetes is because you want to have access to all the open source tooling and solutions um, that have been built by the community. And so it's this combination of using um, something like EKS uh, on top of the, all the tools and solutions you see on the slide um, that can really build a very powerful SSP that can meet your business needs. And so um, if you guys are familiar with the, uh, the famous quote by Kelsey Hightower, um, if we take a step back, you know, Kubernetes is, is a platform to build other platforms, right? And that's why we really want to push the shared services platform model, because that's exactly what we're doing here, right? Is we're using Kubernetes as our infrastructure layer to then build a platform to enable um, our organizations, both from a platform and application perspective. And so when we take all these things into consideration, we have all the tools we need to be successful in doing just that. Um, and so with that said, I uh, just want to give a, a high level overview of kind of what is available to you when you're thinking about building a shared services platform or, you know, if you're already in the process and are curious about the different options that you have for tooling, um, this kind of gives you a good idea of what you have access to. And so with that said, uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, the, the, here's just another quote, uh, you know, just based, based on looking at that screenshot, uh, there's no shortage of, shortage of amazing tooling um, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. I know for me personally, um, every time I go on Reddit or every time I go on, you know, a, a Kubernetes forum, I'm always learning about a new technology or a new tool that is solving a problem that, um, you know, a lot of folks are looking to solve. And so, again, uh, that's a reason why I really like to use Kubernetes as the compute foundation for a shared services platform. Uh, it's because, again, you know, I get access to all this amazing tooling. And so, uh, with that said, uh, before I hand it back over to the Refay team, um, you know, this is why, you know, I personally like to uh, recommend customers to take a look at Refay to build uh, or leverage an SSP on top of EKS, uh, because together, not only have we come up with the right set of tools and services to help you build and operate an effective SSP, um, but we'll also provide you the right guidance and best practices so that you can help your organization meet your desired outcomes. And so with that said, uh, that's exactly what Mohan and the team will dive into in the rest of this webinar. So I'll pass it back over to the Refay team. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate it. Um, so before we get started with uh, uh, a few more things, uh, we thought it'd be good to kind of help you guys reflect on everything you heard from Andrew. So we have a quick poll. Uh, should just take about 30 seconds uh, for you to look at the questions and, uh, and uh, answer them. Um, so uh, I'm just going to throw up the questions here, and I think Kyle will bring up the poll um, at the same time. So, uh, so essentially, uh, the question is, there are uh, some key use cases that organizations are um, uh, hoping to solve um, using an SSP. And, and these are the services, some of the services that we heard that uh, platform teams are looking to offer uh, the end customers. And uh, this is a common set of patterns. So uh, pick one or all that uh, you think uh, you've heard inside your company as, as uh, requirements, and we'll kind of very quickly look at uh, the results. Yeah, so we'll give it just a minute longer, just to make sure everybody who wanted to uh, respond gets the opportunity here. Responses are still coming in. Okay, I think we've kind of hit it. Uh, I'm going to end the poll here in three, two, one. All right, so let's take a look at the results. All right. It looks like uh, uh, other than all of the above, which is like every team, but I guess this, this kind of is very consistent with what we see with uh, most of our customers. Um, 
uh, I think the all of the above is an important thing, which kind of illustrates that the different application teams at uh, different stages of maturity and different needs. So as a common platform team, you kind of have to be ready and willing to experiment with uh, uh, all these service options. So I think that is clear. And the other, I guess, clear leader is, I guess, a cluster as a service, which uh, kind of makes sense as a pattern we see uh, consistently there. Um, in, you know, two years ago, we used to see a namespace as a service as a big, big requirement, but that seems to be shifting towards a cluster as a service because, um, frankly, that level of isolation is, is what many companies desire. Uh, they don't want a noisy neighbor problem, et cetera. So moving to a cluster as a service is definitely a pattern we see that's consistent. Um, thank you, um, Kyle. So I'm going to close the poll here and uh, uh, let's continue. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to start with two case studies. These are um, actually uh, companies we worked uh, very closely with, with Amazon, and, and uh, they, they're all heavy users of Amazon EKS. Uh, the first example is a large financial, and uh, they, they're in the 1400 category. Um, so they, uh, you know, they have a high level charter. So at, at the top level, you know, they, they have a massive modernization initiative, but uh, you know, it was taking too much time and it required uh, resources that were just too difficult for them to maintain and operate. And uh, uh, that comes along with like, how do we find people that have the right skill set across this entire spectrum, um, the CNCF ecosystem that, that you just saw. Um, and uh, on top of that, organizationally, they knew that they were going to have many, many clusters. Um, and uh, they kind of needed a bird's eye view across everything, a single pane of glass, effectively. Uh, they also wanted to enforce things in a consistent manner. As a large regulated entity, uh, they need to enforce policies across the company. And so that you, know, you don't have like 50 snowflakes inside uh, the company. They want some level of consistency and, uh, and uh, homogeneity, allowing people to innovate around it. Um, so things like RBAC, th things like isolation boundary uh, management, and things like how do I give people access? Those are like big problems for them. And uh, we've been working together with AWS to help them get there. I think, I think in two months, there were like 60, 70 clusters and you know many, many applications have been onboarded. And uh, the last I heard, uh, from, from the leader there, this year, they're going to take pedal to metal and have another 200 plus applications um, uh, onboarded. So they're accelerating the journey uh, after proving everything in, in 2021. So that's, that's an example of how an organization was able to leverage a, a shared services platform strategy where they could standardize and innovate and accelerate at the same time. So it seems like you know, a sensible approach for people to take. Hey, Mohan, I, we have a question here from, from the audience. Uh, I think it'd be good to kind of cover. Um, let me read it to you here. Our ops SRE team is extremely busy with production and staging environments. Uh, is it possible to offload EKS provisioning and lifecycle management for dev and QA environments via policies and controls? Yeah. Yeah, Carl, I think it's a great question. This is a this is a pattern we uh, hear from many many companies. I mean, they, if you think about it, an ops and SRE team. I mean, they 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 are really challenged for time, right? Uh, yeah, just keeping the production environments stable and uh, and and uh, scalable is, is a lot of work. But then, if you are a developer and you're supporting hundreds of application teams. How do you help them out? Because they don't have time to invest in learning Kubernetes and uh, everything about infrastructure, et cetera. It's a lot of um, uh, effort. And they have their own uh, sprints to complete and deliverables to complete. Uh, so the way uh, we've actually looked at this problem about, you know, it, it, we've added support for an interesting capability called cluster templates. This is something that uh, uh, organizations have kind of been pushing us towards. Effectively, it's a, it's a self-service model where an ops and SRE team can go in and define a template and basically specify in a template what the developer can change and cannot change. 
Um, and using that kind of an approach, they can offload many of these operations to a self-service model to these uh, uh, downstream teams, which means a developer can spin up clusters, spin down clusters, but they can only, they had to follow the rules. An example of that, um, you know, one of our customers uses this exact model to make sure that all development teams can only use spot instances. They have to use spot instances and that to spot instances of a certain type of instance uh, because they have reservations also against them. So uh, they make sure that uh, development teams are able to spin up clusters on their own, but they do that at a incredibly um, uh, low cost on, on, uh, on EKS uh, uh, using their FA SSP platform. This is an example of how people have accelerated and not held back uh, development teams. Um, was there anything else I missed in that, uh, Kyle, or? Um... No, I think that was, that was good. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. And let's read in questions as they come along, because if the context is right, it'll be, it'll be appropriate. Okay. Uh, the next example I want to just mention, uh, this is also a, a large company, uh, but they are in the insurance business. They are also strategically aligned with Amazon and EKS. You know, they've kind of chosen that because it provides them a consistent uh, stable, reliable, uh, and uh, innovative platform, a Kubernetes plat platform for them. Um, so their challenges were, uh, you know, they're also, you know, accelerating dramatically to onboard new applications, uh, which means they had to give people environments, right? This kind of comes back to that whole question about, you know, I want to provide environments as a service. Um, yeah, so like, uh, uh, a staging environment, a production environment, maybe a uh, test bed, uh, everything on EKS. And uh, they want to reduce the time it takes uh, from the time a request comes in and the time when the application is on board. And they want to automate everything. And uh, uh, again, the same consistent problem of uh, there's a few people in the company who know Kubernetes well, the rest of them are learning. It's a big hill to climb for them. And as a regulated company, again, uh, the need to implement org-wide standards, right? Again, no snowflakes. They were struggling with service account and policy sprawl. Uh, every business unit was doing something different and uh, it was just very hard for them to report out to auditors and uh, security teams as to uh, what is the current state and who did what. Uh, and they were also looking at, you know, the, the, the self-service model as a way by which they can accelerate this because uh, again, uh, speed is uh, king here, uh, velocity is king. So uh, again, at scale deployments, uh, uh, same consistent problem, uh, but just in a different vertical. And uh, again, as you can see here, none of these customers have one or two clusters. All of them have the need for like 50, 60, 100 clusters. It, it's, uh, um, it's an at scale problem, not a, a when you're getting started problem. Okay. Um, so with that, let's let's kind of talk about the key requirements for an SSP. Um, hey, man, we, yeah, is it okay if I we have another question here? I think um, yeah, you okay? sure, sure. Did yeah, you, yeah, let's let's wait? go back. Yes. Okay. Um, if we implement a, a shared services platform using Rafe, uh, will we be able to provide our leadership team a comprehensive operational dashboard that's centralized for all business units? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, I think this is a very good question as well. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges we keep hearing from organization, especially leadership team is you know, anything to do with modernization of applications, et cetera, you know, it tends to be, you know, something of a board level conversation. And sometimes these are even reported out in the annual reports and the quarterly reports as to how we're doing, et cetera. Um, so it's a big deal. And if you are a leader, in an ops leader or an engineering leader uh, who has to report out to uh, uh, CIO or CEO, you need a sense of what the hell is going on across my applications. Actually, uh, what I'm gonna do is maybe uh, use this as a chance to very quickly show what an, a dashboard could, should look like uh, that'll help people answer some of these questions. So I'm just gonna pivot to that for 30 seconds and come back. Um, so let's see if I have that open here. Um, yeah, okay. So here's an example, uh, Rafi dashboard. 
um, it's, an, it's an example tenant. Um, and as you can see here, right? So there are 21 projects. Projects can map to business units or environments. And people ideally want to see this number kind of go up like that, right? Like as uh, an accelerating um, adoption uh, would, would indicate that. The same thing with number of clusters, right? So you kind of want the number of cluster to trend up as you open up more and more uh, companies, uh, more and more business units and have them adopt more and more clusters. Number of users, are more developers actively accessing the clusters? Are they doing things? Uh, are more applications being deployed? And then things like policies, like are there any policy violations? Uh, you know, you can centrally enforce policies and then come back and say, hey, uh, how come this team is doing stuff in a weird manner? Uh, maybe I need to go back to them and help them get healthy. Um, and, uh, you know, by things like, you know, environments, am I consuming resources? Like, am I over-provisioned, under-provisioned? Uh, and then look for anomalies, right? Like, uh, you know, who is the busiest, who has got the busiest cluster? Uh, who, is, who is the top user? Like in this particular case, I have this user who has been accessing a lot and let's see, uh, she's also been accessing kubectl a lot, right? So you can centralize access policies, et cetera. This is an example of a dashboard. This is an org-wide dashboard. And then you have something very similar for projects. If you want to go back and say, hey, I want to see what's going on in, um, let's, uh, let's look at this project, the QA project. And there's a dashboard provided there, giving people a sense of uh, what's happening there, how many applications, how many pods, um, how many namespaces. So people get a view of everything. Um, and all this data can be exported out uh, uh, to uh, a different platform. Like, you know, some people I know have been using Tableau to slice and dice this data differently. Um, and uh, that's, this is an example of how uh, the right people can be given access. So they have uh, their fingers on the pulse of what's going on in the company and can report and track progress uh, uh, as needed uh, to the leadership. Well, was there anything else in that question, Kyle, that I missed or? Um, no, but we do have another one. Um, not sure if you can see the Q&A yourself. I, I can read it to you as well. If you um, could read it to me, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Is it possible Is it possible for the host to elaborate on environment as a service? As I understand, we can create namespace per environment's basis, say dev and production. Yeah, absolutely. So um, multi-tenancy in a single Kubernetes cluster, it can result in all kind of weird unwanted problems. Uh, at minimum, uh, if you go with a namespace as a service, one of the risks you have to plan and account for is the noisy neighbor problem. So if you've had customers where uh, one namespace, resources in a namespace have done things that have been kind of violating security policies or uh, they've been uh, in a position where they've kind of uh, effectively uh, done a denial of service on, on the cluster in a manner of speaking, where other resources will starve. Now, there are ways to counter this uh, and control and mitigate all of these, but that requires a lot of finessing and perfecting, which, uh, and getting a lot of people to do the right things, which, uh, you know, human nature never happens. So, what we see customers kind of moving to is a model where they say, look, the EKS cluster itself, the control plane itself is, is insignificant. It's, it's, I think $72 a month, right? It's nothing for a company. Um, so the managed master is not the problem. Um, it's, it's your, uh, uh, the EC2 nodes or the, the Fargate nodes, whatever you, you, you have uh, to run your uh, services. That's kind of what th that the money is. Um, so they have gone down the model, but they said that, look, I will, uh, give people a dedicated cluster uh, per application and not always have a namespace. A namespace is an option, but kind of go there. And for environments, like, you know, separating production from dev, from uh, pre-production, like, you know, QA, uh, they, instead of giving them namespaces, they have complete isolation there. Um, and uh, you saw the concept of projects when I was showing you the, the console. The projects are a way by which you can completely isolate them and make sure the right people have access to the right uh, projects. 
with uh, which map to individual EKS clusters or, or any cluster for that matter uh, behind the scenes. So this is the model we see people gravitating to. It seems like two, three years ago, people were experimenting with namespaces, but frankly, it's very hard to implement the right controls and uh, guarantee there's no business risk. Eventually it comes down to business risk. Is that application owner willing to take that business risk if something goes wrong? If not, move them to a dedicated cluster uh, because maybe they have an SLA that is extreme. Uh, uh, hopefully I answered that question. Um, uh, so the service there is uh, the, the platform team basically says, look, we'll give you automation where we can spin up uh, uh, production, uh, staging, and a pre-production environment. And uh, they will map to these policies. And uh, if you want to be outside these policies, well, file an exception. And they get all of that like immediately without having to do anything. And the developers can log in automatically because everything is connected back to your single sign-on system. Uh, as your developers come and go, it automatically policies follow them. So they don't have to even remember anything. They just have to focus on their work. So that's, that's essentially an environment as a service that we see organizations want to provide. Um, uh, Kyle, should I continue moving? I um, want to make sure. Yeah, yeah that, thanks. Well, that was the last one we had for now. So appreciate okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, um, and let's see how far we can get with the key requirements for an SSP. Uh, so Andrew touched on some of these um, and uh, I'll kind of add to that and, uh, and uh, uh, add some more clarification. Um, so as organizations uh, mature with Kubernetes, um, they'll end up having a problem with the inherent complexity that comes with scale. Uh, this has got nothing to do specifically with Kubernetes. This happens with any environment, right? Any system, when you have a lot and you have a lot of applications and a lot of users kind of messing around with it, um, complexity creeps in. So what are those uh, complexities? And this is a survey that CNCF did in 2020. And uh, the top challenges for them were, um, they need a way by which they can apply consistent controls. Do the right people have access to the right clusters? I don't want to do anything manually. It should all be completely automated. How do I manage multiple clusters? Maybe spanning multiple security domains. Maybe I unfortunately have to be in hybrid because that's what my business model is. How do I do that? Uh, some people are being forced to go multi-cloud. Uh, there's a complex ecosystem here that has to get integrated. And people are looking for prescriptive ways by which they can consume it before they start experimenting. Like as Andrew was alluding to, there's a lot of options, a lot of choices, but businesses have to make money. Projects have to get delivered on time. Sometimes it's better to get a prescriptive solution to solve your problem before you can come up for air and start uh, experimenting with other advanced technologies, which you may at some point of time bring in and standardize. Security and compliance, big problem for companies because you, know, the, you cannot have a wild west uh, uh, Kubernetes environment, right? So not again, not talking one cluster, talking about a fleet of clusters. And this is where um, uh, people land up struggling uh, as a scale. And uh, this is where, um, uh, you know, uh, an SSP platform can substantially help you uh, alleviate the pain. Um, so let me, let's look at that again in a slightly different manner, right? Uh, and we've seen this again and again and uh, uh, with, with organizations. Um, typically what happens is there's one pathfinder team in a company. Uh, the first team that maybe went into cloud native and have containerized the apps, because not everyone's kind of jumping on that immediately, right? Like the company just making the leap, start there first. They, they pick a distribution, they provision a test cluster, Everything looks easy, right? You know, I can do a kubectl command, a help command. Everything looks easy. There's like two users um, uh, who need access. I can manage that. You know, I, duct tape looks great for that point of time because I don't need anything else. And now at uh, a later juncture, when there are many, many, many companies uh, or business units inside, many, many developers uh, starting to do things, suddenly the problem is different. 
as you can see here, all these little puzzle pieces, right? Like you now have to build those out. And this is where companies start saying, holy cow, I did not sign up to do this. This is not fun anymore. Uh, and, uh, and this is where uh, a self-service platform starts making sense because you know, effectively you, it can eliminate all these issues that you're seeing there. That's kind of in, in, in essence, I mean, Andrew had a beautiful slide describing this in his, um, in his section. Uh, this is kind of what um, he was alluding to. Uh, how do I nail all these issues? Um, so this is kind of where, you know, if, 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 if you ask me, Mohan, what are the three things I should think about for an SSP? You know, like, you know, you showed me a lot. I can't absorb all of that. Just talk to me about three things I should worry about. I would say pick these three. You want a unified platform. You want centralization of things. Uh, you want to avoid as many snowflakes as possible, if you can, uh, at least to help people scale fast, move fast. In this unified platform, you will centrally manage cluster and app lifecycle. And uh, I would say pick a distribution like EKS, which is, which is world-class, right? It's backed by an SLA. It's extremely well aligned with um, the rest of the AWS infrastructure. So if you use AWS for everything else, EKS is your choice, right? You should not be thinking about anything else. Um, and uh, Andrew and I, interestingly, we've done a few other webinars uh, last year, so you can find them in the, in the backlog of webinars where we talked about you know, why EKS, uh, uh, how we can use EKS, uh, why is it good? So uh, do listen to that as well. Um, the unified platform should help you automate everything, right? It should not, you know, manual stuff is not gonna let you scale. Um, so everything should be automated to the extent possible. Um, but the key thing here is you don't wanna be the one writing the automation because then you're gonna build snowflakes, right? So we see companies saying, look, I don't want to build the automation. Give me automation for things that are well understood and uh, well thought about. The next thing you need is, you know, this ecosystem we saw. You need a way by which you can consume a lot of this with best practices quickly and easily, right? So you don't want to be experimenting with 50 tools, making this a two-year project because then the project will get, get shut down by, by leadership, right? So you want to move fast. Something that's tightly integrated, seamless, and everything done with the right best practice of zero trust security, right? So ensure you have that. Finally, maybe the most important thing is you want a consumption model, which is a form factor of this SSP, which is SaaS. Right? Like if you go into Amazon, a, you know, you're consuming everything as a service. Why do you want to suddenly flip your logic and say, hey, I want to do something different. I want to install a million things and build my own platform. I would recommend, and, and we would recommend that look at a SaaS-based uh, form factor for the SSP because it'll help you get started in, in hours, not months, not, um, not weeks. You'll be up and going in hours. And uh, the case studies that we kind of highlighted, I think are, are great examples of that, but people were able to get to like supporting 50, 60 teams with 60, 70 clusters with like two people in the ops and SRE team supporting them, right? So they're focusing on outcomes, not on the technology. You want that SaaS platform to essentially have unlimited scalability and multi-tenancy. Um, and uh, this is really, really important. It's the one that helps you scale. And uh, when you combine all of this together, what you effectively get is low total cost of ownership, right? Uh, you don't want to basically have a budget of a million dollars to do this in three years and get nothing done. Um, so this is what we would recommend to our customers. Um, and this is what they are voting with their wallet um, uh, to move fast. So there's the three things I would encourage you to look at. Um, there's a lot of other things behind the scenes, but uh, these are the three I would highlight. Okay. Mo, we so have, this is, yeah. Go, we go have ahead. another question in if, if, if it's a good time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of our developers and operations team's top requests is instant access to EKS clusters without being required to use VPNs or bastions. How does your solution or a shared services platform address this requirement? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not surprised by this question. 
uh, and I'm suspecting that person maybe caught on to the zero trust word um, to ask this question. Um, so this has been uh, an interesting uh, thing for us, especially in the last two years since we are all been kind of being forced to work remotely because of COVID. Uh, but two years ago, uh, we launched a service called Zero Trust Kubectl. The whole goal was helping developers access uh, their clusters with the right access and authentication permissions uh, without requiring any form of inbound access, which means no VPNs, no bastions. I should be able to do it from a laptop, uh, maybe even from a browser, and uh, everything should be audited. Right? You know, this is not a wild west. So if I type something uh, on kubectl, the auditor should be, or the security team should be able to say, okay, Mohan did this at this time, and here's the command he ran. So this is interestingly, ever since COVID came along uh, and people are working remotely, this has been the hottest feature uh, in our platform. It's the most heavily used feature in our platform. It's actually, I'll kind of allude to that very quickly, the zero trust access service. And, and why not show it? very briefly for the folks that may have not seen it. So I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna find a cluster, which is uh, EKS here, just to show how easy it can be. Uh, I'm gonna pick, uh, I'm gonna pick one that's uh, healthy. So I'm gonna go to this cluster. This is Benny's cluster. Uh, and uh, uh, you can either download the kube config for this, or if you notice here, I'm just showing you a browser-based experience where you get things like autocomplete um, and, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, even though this cluster is running behind a firewall, it's running behind a security group in some AWS region, I was able to access this instantly. And I can do whatever command you want using kubectl. Now, um, I can also control stuff. I can basically say that, hey, Mohan only belongs to this namespace. So I can lock him down to just a namespace, all that automatically follows is identity, right? So what identity you have in the company uh, maps to your policy. And then let's look at the audits very quickly, right? So, uh, well, I just typed some commands. Um, and uh, uh, if you notice here, I just ran this on this cluster, right? Uh, I just ran this command, you just saw me run it. So there's an audit trail of everything. So what our customers are doing is using this as a way to control who can do what, map that automatically to the central identity provider, whether they use Okta or whether they use Azure Ready or Ping or anything else, they type to that source of truth, allow developers to have instant access to what they need and have a full audit trail of what they ran and stream these logs to their security system, whether they use Flunk or something else, uh, and they don't run the analytics there to make sure that there's no anomalies happening, nothing weird happening. So this, as you can see here, right, it, been one of the most heavily used features in a platform. In fact, we have customers using the platform just for this from a start, right? They start there to say that this is the only way I can bring um, a sense to my environment of 50, 60 clusters, and then I'll look at everything else. So. So that's the zero trust kubectl. Hopefully I answered that question about um, how people can access stuff, et cetera. Um, there are other services also available in the platform. Uh, so currently we have six and we're building many more that will be launched this, this year. And that's, that's what we believe is a shared service platform running on top of EKS and, and, and their world-class infrastructure from Amazon. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if there are any more questions, Kyle. That was kind of the end of my slides. Yeah, um, perfect. We're right at the basically 10 minute mark. So um, if, uh, if folks want to um, use the Q&A um, to enter any additional questions, um, let's, let's um, make sure you, you do that. And uh, let me keep an eye out. We'll give it just a second here and... Um, yeah, any, whether it be about the topic today or anything Kubernetes related, feel free uh, at the bottom of your screen to enter in the Q&A.
Okay, I, I got one here. Uh, how do I ensure that I avoid the noisy neighbor problem across tenants on my platform? Yeah, Andrew, um, you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, so just real quickly, uh, when we think about Kubernetes, just in general, um, so Kubernetes was designed as a single tenant orchestrator, right? And so what that means is that when we think about the Kubernetes control plane, um, and that control plane is shared among multiple tenants within that particular cluster. And so what that said is, you know, if you're trying to build a SaaS uh, platform or application um, on Kubernetes, you have to start thinking about, you know, how do you create um, isolation boundaries between your tenants uh, within your cluster, right? And so while there's a handful of different ways to approach this, um, I think there are a few immediate things that come to mind uh, for me personally, uh, when I think about how to approach this. And so within Kubernetes, you have things like Kubernetes objects uh, that you can use to create like a balance, if you will, of uh, multi-tenancy uh, across your cluster. So uh, when you think about things like namespaces, uh, role-based access control, um, network policies, um, you know, uh, quotas or limit ranges for uh, applications that are being deployed within a namespace within the cluster, right? Um, you know, there are a handful of different combinations of things you can use that Kubernetes offers out of the box to achieve this. Um, so that would be the first thing I'd call out there. Um, and then if you want to uh, go down the path of hard multi-tenancy, especially if you're in a highly regulated industry, um, there's other ways to kind of approach this as well. Um, but typically when I'm talking to folks that are kind of early on the journey on how to provide tenant isolation at the most basic level within a cluster, um, I typically have them start thinking about, you know, how are you breaking down your namespaces? Um, you know, for your application teams that only need access to certain resources, um, taking a look at the roles that you are assigning to those application teams and making sure that they only have access to things they need, right? Um, and a good example of this is, you know, if you have an application team that has full access to create and destroy resources in the cluster, uh, that can be very dangerous <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, so again, making sure that you are leveraging things like Kubernetes roles um, as effectively as possible, right? Um, and then the next step from there is, you know, when an application team is actually in the process of deploying new applications, um, making sure that you're setting those quotas and limit ranges appropriately so that they're not overloading the cluster or taking more resources that they need so that, you know, in the case that there are other application teams that need access to those resources as well, um, that they're not hogging up all the resources, right? And so uh, that's the that's where I'd probably start there um, when we think about tenant isolation is you know using some of the things that Kubernetes offers out of the box um, to create those boundaries uh, separately. And then if you know in the context of EKS, uh, you can manipulate things like subnets and security groups, um, things like that. But you know for for simple starters, uh, I'd start with things like namespaces, roles, limits, quotas, and then um, things like network policies. Uh, and that's kind of where I'd start. Uh, I'm not sure if I, Mohan, if you want to add anything, add anything to that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, so maybe just adding to that, uh, I kind of alluded to this in an earlier thing. I mean, the EKS control plan itself, uh, Andrew, is it like $70 a month or something like that? 72, I think, to be precise. Depending um, on the compute, yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, some people just say, hey, look, I, I'll just clean up another cluster for this other use case and be done with it, right? Like, um, it, it's not like going to be horribly expensive. Uh, so uh, that's another multi-tenancy model that we've seen people use. Uh, sometimes it's just easier to give that other team a uh, net new cluster and move on. Okay, we have another one. Is Rafe planning to support SDK for Python? Yeah, the um, uh, answer is yes. Um, we've, uh, uh, so we currently have a Swagger API. Uh, it's actually available right in our console. And uh, uh, one of the targets we are looking to build, um, um, leveraging that uh, is, uh, you know, SDK is for multiple languages and Python being one of the top ones that we keep hearing from people. So I think like Python and Golang and, and there's a few others that keep coming up. The answer is yes. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if there's immediate interest, uh, just work with us. Uh, you know, we've helped a few others kind of uh, with private bills until we go GA uh, with that particular SDK. So let us know. Uh, we're absolutely happy to work with you. 
Okay, uh, next one. How does the shared services platform improve efficiency for software delivery? Andrew, you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I uh, I mentioned this uh, during my portion of the webinar. Um, but you know, when you think about some of the components that build um, the shared services platform, right? A lot of it comes down to automation, uh, things like CI/CD, and really processes and tools that help application teams deploy and develop applications quicker in the cloud. Um, so. I guess in my mind, it, it's not necessarily um, the application team's uh, issue or a problem, if you will. Um, it's really more on the platform team to ensure that they're providing the right tools and processes for those application teams to be as effective and productive as possible. And this really becomes an issue of tooling, right? Like, are you actually choosing the right tooling and solutions to enable your application teams to move as quickly as they should, right? Um, and making sure that um, the boundaries of how those application teams and platforms work together um, are crystal clear so that, you know, if there are issues or if there are bugs, um, you know, those things can get resolved as quickly as possible, right? But I think the core piece of it is, you know, again, you just have to make sure that you're using the right automation tools so that, you know, again, your, your teams can move quicker um, and deploy things into production much faster as well. Um, so basically, you know, the, the underlying theme here is how do I get my uh, my developer from their local environment to production ready as quickly as possible uh, using the tools that my platform team has chosen for my platform. Um, so that's typically the way I think about it. Uh, Mohan, I don't, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think it, you summarized it nicely. Um, not much to add there. Yeah. Okay, uh, running out of time, so I'm gonna move on. Um, is there a way to implement organization-wide standardization for consistency and best practices? Yeah, uh, Andrew, you want to tag team on this? Uh, um, yeah. Let's start with you, and then maybe I'll add a few other things around it. Sorry, uh, could you repeat the question one more time? Uh, I broke up. I broke up for yeah. a little bit. Is there a way to implement organization-wide standardization for consistency and best practices? Yeah, and so um, I guess kind of just. Uh, adding to you know making sure you're picking the right tools and processes for your platform um Rafay actually has a, a really cool concept um what they call a blueprint right and so this the concept of a blueprint allows you to have you know a certain level of consistency across all of your clusters for new and existing clusters and so um you know i think being able to standardize on templates for your platform teams to deploy new resources and tooling is crucial um, because you need that consistency across all your different environments and all, across all the different clusters that you may be working across, right? Um, and so if you don't have um, a centralized point to refer back to uh, when you're deploying these new resources or clusters, um, things can get really messy. And it, typically, from, at least from what I've seen from customers that have struggled with this concept, um, is it provides a lot of inconsistency, <laughs> if you will. Um, and so I think having that centralized blueprint that, you know, encompasses all of the right tooling and processes that you need to be effective within a new cluster, um, I think is, is the, the main thing that uh, I call out there. Um, I'm sure Mon, you have some more thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I, I think you said it really well, Andrew. There's the only thing I would like to add on to that is, uh, um, it, you know, consistency or the lack of it can result in all kind of weird problems. Uh, like I'll just give maybe two examples that I've heard from customers um, literally uh, earlier today uh, before this webinar. Um, one of them said, hey, look, um, how do I make sure across 50 clusters that we don't have components that have this, you know, like cluster-wide add-ons that are running anything below version X uh, of an ingress controller or something else? Um, leveraging something like blueprints uh, that, that Andrew alluded to uh, helps people achieve that, right? So you can basically say, hey, I need to make sure every cluster in under management has to be blueprint version uh, two or higher. And blueprint version two carries maybe the patched, secure, not vulnerable version of that particular add-on. Um, and then people can monitor that and see that, hey, I, I'm not gonna force feed every team, but I'm gonna make sure that, um, you know, over the next two weeks, we need everyone to update. Um, uh, uh, or uh, they had to file for an exception. Um, so this is, makes it easy for people to implement processes inside um, and, and workflows inside. So eventually it's a, it's a workflow problem for people. 
and a process problem. It's not just a technology problem. All right, uh, Mo, if you wanna just uh, move to, I guess, two slides, I believe, one more, here you go. We, yeah. Folks, it looks like we're out of time. That's all the time we have for, for now. <clears throat> so uh, I'm not sure that we got through all of the questions entered, but uh, we, we have captured them and we'll make sure to get back to you directly <clears throat> um, after, after the webinar today. So um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out uh, via our website or email info at rafe.co and we'll sure be sure to get back to you as well. Um, thanks, Moha, and special thanks, Andrew, for all the great information and uh, for all of you for, for attending today. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Okay.